Welcome back to Road 237, back with another review. Now, this is not part of the torture porn genre, which is uh, some reviews that I've been doing lately. But this did come out at the same time and is a slasher film. My last review was of Scar 3D, which is kind of a mix of modern slasher and torture porn. This one is more just straight up slasher. Uh, I guess you could call it a renaissance slasher. It does try to evoke a little bit of the 80s, especially in the kind of narrative and urban legend type story. A lot of the tropes, some of the genre favorites within the cast. I would say the... How, how it feels 80s isn't quite as strong as, say, Hatchet or uh, Behind the Mask, but... There are moments that kind of make it feel like an 80s slasher film. I know there's a Blu-ray poster that makes it, or a Blu-ray cover rather, that does look like a classic vintage 80s slasher cover. Yeah, I do like that. But overall, I'm not a big fan of this film. And it's from 2000, well this said 2009, but the back of the DVD says 2011. Uh, I'm just going to go with 2009. Blood Knight, The Legend of Mary Hatchet. Now, maybe it premiered at festivals in 2009. It probably just didn't get put out on DVD until 2011. It was released on DVD in 2010. And then a different company in 2011. And then it was released by Lionsgate in 2011. Okay, well, still, it premiered at Freak Show Horror Festival in October of 2009. Now, it was written and directed by Frank Sabatella and co-written with Elke Blasi. And it stars genre favorites Danielle Harris and Bill Mosley, along with Nate Dushku, who is a brother of Eliza Dushku. Uh, Bill Magnuson... Uh, Samantha Feci, Anthony Marks, Alyssa Dean, just a bunch of people that I can't even click on. So it was made for $3 million. I don't really see it. Uh, it it's only 84 minutes, but it feels like it drags at times. And I think it's a lot of that's because of the pacing. It had two cinematographers, Jared. Uh, Blaschke and Christopher Walters and Victor Bruno with Steven Tubin on music. The music was alright. Not a whole lot I could say about it. Save for the climax. The climax was like this nice kind of uh, uh, suspenseful kind of pounding. Like, boom. Boom. Even when the killer was walking on tile it kind of sounded kind of sounded like a rhythm. But yeah, some positives I can give it is, story-wise, it is kind of set up like a slasher. It, it opens up in 1978, then 1989, to give us the backstory of this urban legend. Which actually, before I get into that, it was actually filmed at the um, Essex Mountain Sanatorium, which has been run down for years. It is apparently haunted. And I guess the cast and crew experienced some kind of spooky stuff not to the extent of like the exorcist and the omen but uh you know some strange feelings and a, a, a bump in the night type stuff and even though i'm not a huge believer in the supernatural i am a huge sucker for you know abandoned run down supposedly haunted uh hospitals asylums sanatoriums i just Especially if it still has all the equipment in it. I've always just loved that look. Just has like this dirty kind of uh, uh, Arkham Asylum type feel to it. Which I believe that is in New Jersey. Uh, of Essex Mountain Sanatorium. But it takes place at uh, Kings Park Sanatorium. Which uh, there is a couple of ghost legends from there as well, which one of these is based on, I believe, uh, Kings Park Psychiatric Center. Yeah, I do believe that, uh, 
it tells one version of an urban legend of uh, a patient there. So, uh, I do like the setting of the hospital, which is really just the opening and the very end. But, so yeah, it opens up in 1978 with a young Mary Maddock gets her first period and she has menstrual psychosis, which I guess is a real thing. Very rare, but it is real. Where she just goes nuts, kills her parents with uh, a hatchet or an axe, uh, is deemed crazy, goes to Kings Park Sanatorium or the psychiatric center. 1989, she's raped by a night guard, impregnated. She's told that her baby was stillbirth, and she then goes on a killing spree, killing everyone she can, severs the head of her rapist, and is shot down by police outside when she throws the head at them. And since then, uh, I believe it's the anniversary, because it, it is in October, but I don't think it's Blood Night or Devil's Night, like the night before Halloween. Uh, I could be wrong. I, I don't remember uh, if it said, but uh, yeah, it, the the anniversary of her attack really. It's become this urban legend that this naked ghost will appear and beheads people and tries to find her baby. So I I like how it sets up the urban legend, and we even get a, a spooky ghost story about. Uh, something that happened to some locals since uh, her death told by Bill Mosley which I always love when there's like a spooky ghost story around a fire especially if it revolves around the urban legend reminds me of John Carpenter's The Fog which it, one positive I can give is Bill Mosley actually has a character it's not just putting his name and face on the cover and then just making him appear very quickly like Rob Zombie's Halloween. He actually has a character. He's the uh, graveyard caretaker alcoholic who is dressed exactly like uh, Crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th. And then basically the story is there's these kids, this big group of teenagers, they want to go have a seance at the cemetery try to talk to a Mary Hatchet. That's what she's known as now. Gus tells him to leave, gives him the ghost story. And then they go to party at some house. I was wondering if it was actually Mary's house or just the house of one of the kids. Because the house still looked new and functional, not like it has been empty since 78. But they, uh, yeah, they go to this party, and Danielle Harris is one of the friends. And this movie tries to have a twist, but you know right off the bat what the twist is going to be that it's Danielle Harris, because obviously it's going to be her. And these kids are killed off one by one. And yeah, it does take a while. Uh, for how much blood and gore is in this movie, which is another positive I can give it, it does take a while. I mean, we have the, the backstory in the beginning where we see her kill her parents. And I mean, the first kill, she stabs her mother in the eye. And I mean, it is just spraying blood everywhere. There's always like... This is one of those movies where it's like a Mortal Kombat <laughs> amount of blood, just excessive. It's not trying to be serious or realistic at all. So, which is fun and entertaining. But, like the whole midsection of them get ready for the party, which also, none of these characters are very likable. They're all obnoxious and annoying. 
first they go around terrorizing the town, like throwing eggs at cars and throwing toilet paper at cars and houses, eggs at houses. They hang uh, tampons everywhere because of the legend of uh, Mary Hatchet uh, killing her mother the night of her first period. And then from like, from the opening up until the kills at the party, it feels like forever. And for a while, it just feels like, okay, we're just kind of getting uh, dancing and striptease, sex scene, sex scene, sex scene. Uh, oh, it looks like someone's going to get killed. Oh, no, we're going to cut back, back to a sex scene. And to me... Yes, I know slashers have always had gratuitous nudity and sex scenes, but to me it just kind of bogs the film down. Uh, so a lot of the kills are really once you get to like the third act or well into the third act. It feels like one of those 80 slashers where, you know, if you go to my 80 slasher playlist, I talk about this in many of them. Where it's like all story. And then the slasher film is like right in the third act. Like the last 10-15 minutes. Uh, uh, some of the cinematography is kind of weird. I get what they're going for. Like whenever we see Mary kill, kill someone. Whether it be in the beginning. Or even some of the kills uh, in the present. It goes into like this very glitchy uh jerky kind of, of editing will be like uh up close they're far away they're like weird it very fast but very shaky not quite as shaky as like a steven c miller film but it it will be like flashes of like red filters i know it's supposed to be kind of disorientating but a lot of times it just kind of took away from it also, there's kills, like this one guy goes goes out to th uh, puke, and the camera holds on him as he falls backwards and like tries to get away. Then we like pull in on his face like he's about to get an axe or something, and then it just quick cuts to looking down in a blender, <laughs> making like a strawberry drink. Which, I mean, if it's stylized like that, that's kind of fine. You do get... There was one kill that had a pretty interesting, like, Sam Raimi-type uh, camera angle where there's this couple having sex, the guy's on top, and he gets a large pair of scissors through you know, his chest or his neck or something, but the scissors are open. So we get, like, a POV from the wound facing the girlfriend. So from the camera, we see, like, the uh, scissors coming out. It's like her head's like right in between, but it's like the scissors are in the foreground. I thought that was a, a interesting angle. There's also a lot of fade to blacks, which is a little excessive. It doesn't make you feel like a TV movie, but... Uh. Then they all start to realize uh, that people are dead. There's dead bodies there, so they all have to flee. And that's when uh, Crazy Ralph, a.k.a. Graveyard Gus, shows up. He seems to be the guy to know everything. Like, let's go to the sanatorium. If we dig up her baby, give it to her, then her spirit will be pleased. And as much as I like Bill Mosley, he is kind of... His performance is more entertaining than it is good. Hey, don't get me wrong, I always enjoy seeing Bill Mosley. But he is kind of playing Bill Mosley. <laughs> and Daniel Harris disappears throughout most of the film. Like, they all get to the house and she does this, probably the longest pussy joke I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, if you've seen the film, then you know what I mean. And then, what's the party kicks up I don't think you really see her and then she just disappears and then it's hinted to that she's a, a, a one of the bodies but you know that you know obviously 
even in the beginning, when they're telling us what's going on, even when they tell Mary that her baby died, I'm sorry, you know they just took it from her and just told her that. Daniel Harris is in the movie, so you know it's going to be her. You might not know which way the film's going to go with it. I mean, is it going to be like she finds out and freaks out? Or is she going to somehow become the next killer? Spoiler alert, it's the second one. Because they get to the sanatorium. They dig up the baby's casket. It's empty. They break inside. They find the file. They find out the baby was born healthy and adopted out to her family. And then that's... We get like this recap of all the kills throughout the film and how it was Daniel Harris that perpetrated all of them. Which... I mean, some of them, like the one where it cuts away and then they go straight to the blender. It does kind of dilute the more stylish ones or like the one where we see the scissors coming through. It does kind of dilute the effect a bit. I would have much rather it either not have the recap or sort of show Danielle Harris turning in to whatever it is she is. Either she's possessed by Barry or she has the same like a menstrual psychosis because she we do see it in these recaps that she is on her period and it's like every time she excuses herself to the bathroom she goes and does a kill it looks like she's fighting it and that she's in pain and kind of going through something but it's not perfectly clear if you know she is kind of possessed or influenced by Mary or just has the same disorder. And then Daniel Harris shows up to the uh, hospital, starts hunting them down. And I do like Daniel Harris. Uh, I do think she is one of the great modern scream queens. It is always fun to see her in something. But she's not a very intimidating killer. <laughs> Uh, especially with how she's shot. Because like, as she's approaching the hospital with this pickaxe, it's in like a wide shot. And Daniel Harris is not very tall or big. So it's like this short a woman carrying a pickaxe. What they could have done, and even when she's walking down the corridor of the hospital, it, it's in like a, a wide sort of mid close-up shot so like her head's like right here they could have done you know like joker when he walks around that corner and he's also suited up like a somewhat up close upward angle kind of make her look imposing but not really and again you do get some good gore in these scenes i mean there's a scene where there's a chick laying like trying to crawl away takes the pickaxe to her, rips the pickaxe out, and it has her spine attached to it. It just keeps, like, spinning it so it coils the intestines around the pickaxe. Cool. Excuse me, you get a death where a guy's head is cut in half this way, which could be a reference to Chainsaw 2, because Bill Mosley even calls uh, Nate Dushku a dog dick. Like Chop Top did in Texas Chainsaw 2. I don't know if this death necessarily was. But. And then when you see the. This part like slide off. The whole fit prosthetic cut. Kind of jiggles. Like you can tell it's all latex or rubber. It, it looks fake. But I've always said. I much prefer that over CGI. So I do applaud it for that. And another part where there's another couple hiding in a room in the hospital where the boyfriend is, like, dragged into the darkness, like, quarantined or wreck. Reaches out for help, gra grabs the girl's hand, but then the pickaxe comes down and cuts her hand off. And when he's dragged back, 
it's not just that. It's it looks like literally a five gallon bucket of thick, dark blood with chunks in it is just like flung at her. Like I don't know what kind of blow could cause a human body to expel that much spatter, but yeah, it was crazy. And so by now they know it's Daniel Harris and she does go down pretty easily. I mean, there's a bit of a scuffle with Nate Dushku. She does kill Bill Mosley. But he gets the upper hand. He he strangles her to death. Him and his girlfriend leave. And it does do the 80s slasher thing where... I mean, I was expecting... I, I have seen this once before. It's been probably about a decade since I've seen it. I only saw it once and I wasn't a big fan of it. And I could tell you a thing that happened before I just now watched it. So I was expecting for when they walked by for her to like grab their ankle or something. She doesn't. But when Nate Dushku and his girlfriend get outside, they have this long scene where they just stare at each other. And then blood splatters on her face. We see that he's decapitated. And then as she turns, we see Mary herself running at her with a hatchet. And then it ends. So it does have the one last jump scare by the killer uh, uh, before the end credits. Yeah, even though there's some nice things I could say about it, uh, you know, Bill Mosley's definitely having fun. Daniel Harris... It's hard to tell with her because she's in the film so little that it's hard to tell if it's a paycheck for her or if it's something she's really into. Uh, the the blood and gore, awesome. It's got a good amount of it. It looks good. I wish the kills were a bit more spread out. That is one of the main problems of the film. F from right after the opening up until the first kill at the party... It is really nothing but partying and sex scenes, just one after another. And it feels like it goes on forever. So the pacing in that regard was kind of not good. Uh, I like the idea of an urban legend. Uh, I always loved that idea. Uh, I even liked the story of uh, Mary, which I guess is based, uh, I said that earlier, that it's based on a patient from uh, Essex Mountain. But there was a couple stories that Frank Sabatella had heard when he was younger that he kind of incorporated into it. So I like the idea of this urban legend and sort of seeing it, seeing the history of it, kind of like an 80 slasher. We get the fill in first, kind of like Halloween, kind of like a Halloween type uh, opening. Not nearly as good. Uh, also, the setting, at least when they get to the sanatorium, it it looks great. I love the look of it. I would have rather the party just have been there. You know, have them think it'd be cool to party there on Blood Night. Uh, I think that would have been awesome. And trying to go for the twist, you know, it's, again, it's very obvious. As soon as they tell Mary that her child was a stillbirth, you know right then, okay, the baby's still alive. Daniel Harris is in it. Which means she's probably the leading lady, even though she's... I mean, is she? There, there's so many people. Like, There's more characters at this party than in like Friday 13th Part 4, which has a lot of characters. But... You, you know it's obviously her. You know she's Mary Hatchett's daughter. And then... Since she disappears throughout most of the film, you know she's involved somehow. You know she's probably the killer. It's not a very good or a covered twist at all. Um, I guess they didn't really know how to write it with... It being known throughout the film and kind of showing what she's going through. I almost would have preferred that. 
Show her being possessed. I mean, show her, like, as her period gets worse or whatever. Have her hear voices or have her being influenced by Mary to go after these people. And then we don't have to get that recap. We can still get initial effective deaths. Like the one with the scissors. Or even some of the off-screen ones. Like the one with the blender. So there are nice things I can say about it. Overall, I'm not a fan of this film. <laughs> I do think it's pretty bad. Uh, 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 even the likes of Bill Mosley and Daniel Harris couldn't save it. Bill Mosley was fun. And I could tell he was enjoying himself, but yeah, overall, and, and not just slashers, but more specifically, uh, uh, well, whether you're looking at it as a modern Renaissance slasher or a slasher overall, uh, I don't think it's a good example of either. I mean, it's kind of structured like a Renaissance slasher or the way an 80s slasher would be. It is structured like one. It goes all out with the nudity and the sex and the blood and the gore. But it... And yeah, there's like some scenes where they find some film reels. And it's attacking the killer tomatoes. And they set it up and they try to watch it. Other than that, it feels very modern. But yeah. I, I can definitely see why I forgot about this film. And why I haven't really watched it more than once. Yeah. Not a fan of it. Don't really like it. That's 2009's or 2010 and 11's Blood, Blood Knight, The Legend of Mary Hatchet. Slasher slash Renaissance Slasher. I guess they both work. But uh, yeah, I'm probably going to continue this look through Torture Porn. I've already done the first Hostel. I haven't done two, two or three. Those might be fun rants, so maybe I'll do those next. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching.